Lowell Robertson, and all these people sit at that table. And I said, I've never been more honored than to have you two Orthodox Islamic men sitting at my table, eating what my wife and I have served you. And of course, I had eaten at their house too. And I wept, and I helped them up, and I hugged their necks and kissed them on both sides of their faces. And I do that with the medicine men. And the Hindu man said, Bishop Pearson, are you telling me that Jesus Christ died for my sin and, and I'm saved? I said, yes, sir. He said, you know. And what, what about my wife and my children and my friend there? He said this to me in my son's classroom. I said, yes. He, he washed his head. You know, for the first time in my life, I believe it. I said, well, I'm not trying to convert you, sir. I just want to convince you of what? That you're loved unconditionally and redeemed in God by Christ. That's it. Then I left the room. I'm preaching the gospel. Y'all ought to be happy. You're not mad at me. Just because I, I took your hell away from you. And your devotion to hell is almost demonic. See, the, 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 the devotion to hell, folks. You know, and you said so many times, you said we always trying to put somebody in hell. And the devil. We might as well sing, and he walks with me and he talks with me. <laughs> And he tells me, because y'all got the devil everywhere. And the more you testify the devil, preach the devil, and elevate the devil, the more the devil manifests in your life. Come to me, and I'll cast him out <laughs> of your thinking. See, you, you're free and don't know it. You're loosed and delivered, and you don't know it. Now, don't let me have to come out there and lay hands on you. Know, you just forgot it. You came here free. You're going to leave here free. But you just forgot it in the, from the womb to the tomb. You forgot who you are and started impersonating who you think people want you to be. Come on back to Jesus. Um, Lucia and let him I want to back up here uh, to a point of uh, there's no argument. There is no argument that God loves everyone. There is no argument there. And unconditionally, uh, that's why Calvary took place. Uh, we are his creation we are made in his image however the scholars the church fathers those that put together the creeds uh athanasius uh, cyprian irenaeus all of them testify to a truth that way back in the garden when god put adam and eve in the garden he said to them this is for you i have one probation for you prohibition do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so in other words at that very point it was evident that the first man and woman had a free will. They had a will that they could exercise contrary to God's will because he said, don't eat of that tree, and that's exactly what they did. The, from that time on, God comes to his people with a message, whether he sends Moses or somebody else or some prophet, and God declares his attitude towards them, his covenantal love towards them. But at the same time, in his sovereignty and love, because it's a love relationship, the reciprocation has to take place that God says, I love you unconditionally. Here's the question. Are you going to choose to love me back? That is the issue, is and that's where, now let me finish. Let me tell your children that? I, I never interrupted you. you I never children? interrupted okay, you. Okay, so the, the, uh, the, let's see. So as a result of that, the, the New Testament and Old Testament is replete with examples where people who had accepted Christ, received him, chose, responded to the message, still decided at some point to walk away from it. What I'm trying to say is, is that love requires that both sides, when I said to my wife, I love you, she said she loved me back. God is not, didn't make us robots. He says, I love you, I, I wanna convince you of that. When you look at Calvary, you ought to know how I feel about you. The question is, are you gonna choose to love me back? And God, if God has not given us a free will to choose or choose not to choose to love him back, then we are all robots. This whole discussion is dead in the water. But the reality is it, church history, the Bible, is Paul's constantly talking about don't go back now. Don't give up. Don't walk away from God. Why? Because we do have a free will. So the issue is not whether God loves all of mankind. The question is, after you hear the gospel, are you going to choose to love him back? because God gives us the right to say no if we don't want to. Now, back to my, da back to my, my daughter. He said, what about your children? Yeah, my, I have a daughter um, a who is a research scientist uh, for AIDS at Wayne State University. She walked away from me. I loved her. I raised her. I watched over her. But at a point in her life, she walked away from me and walked out on us. I cried like a baby. 
It did not change my love for her, but she has a free will. She had the right, even though I'm her parent, to walk away. Now, she has chosen to come back. So we are to go out and tell this whole world. I spend time with Muslims, atheists, all kinds of people. They sleep in my house. I sleep in their houses. I, I do that all the time. But at the same time, when I present Christ to them, and this was the way the apostles and the early church did it, is that when you present Christ to them, the question becomes, the work of the Holy Spirit behind that is that, is that person willing to give up their idol, yes. give up their false god, and turn to him and say, you know what? You are so awesome. Why I've been putting up with all this cheap stuff and these other false religions, and let me accept the true and living God. That's what, that is the good news. That is the good news. What's the good news? Let, let, the good, I just, Thank you, go, Dr. Jackson. Go ahead, doctor. Uh, let me uh, say a couple of things. Uh, first to uh, Bishop that I um, really am glad to be here because for the last couple of nights, uh, I really haven't been able to sleep uh, waiting for this moment uh, in real travail and prayer. Uh, different from Dr. Guyton, who is leap years, quantum leap years ahead of us academically. Uh, I, I, I was. Uh, Preach black. I, uh, <laughs> uh, but you're a Morehouse graduate. Yes, so. I'm, I'm a Morehouse graduate. Uh, I, I uh, was on the last train leaving out. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't have the stellar. Uh, academic credentials that Dr. Van Guyton has. I uh, failed the 11th grade. And uh, in uh, my exit interview being kicked out of the school, uh, the guidance counselor told my parents I wasn't college material. And uh, my parents who believed in prayer uh, says that our son is going to college. Uh, I now have a degree from Morehouse, from Duke, and from Oxford University. And, uh, Amen. The, the, the guidance counselor, the guidance counselor who didn't think I was college material, is now a member of my church. <laughs> and uh, the, the reason, uh, the, the reason why I, I'm here, I, I wasn't in the room with Oakland, uh, and, and don't have the academic credentials. I'm here uh, because of what John and Cecilia Bryant believed in me when I failed, uh, and I said that to say. Uh, I'm here because I'm praying, believing by God's grace that you're going to come back. Uh, and everything in me is here uh, saying that everything has to go through a real season, uh, is that we cannot deal with inclusion without experience. And the fallacy of the whole thesis of inclusion is the love without knowing or accepting. Uh, I didn't learn how to swim until I got to the seventh grade. Uh, and in the seventh grade, uh, I went to a pool party of a friend of mine uh, and was standing around the pool while all of my friends was in the pool. I'm walking around with a towel around my neck, and everybody is saying, jump in the pool. None of them knew I didn't know how to swim. Uh, and so somebody uh, who was trying to push me uh, to the level threw me in the pool. Yeah. When I fell into the pool, I began to flail my arms and kick my legs. Uh, and water began to get into my lungs, and I started to go down. And the people around me didn't know I didn't know how to swim. But somebody had a distinctive eye uh, and could see that I was drowning, even when I was acting like I knew how to swim. So somebody who had a greater sense to see somebody who was losing it jumped in, picked me back up, and delivered CPR to me on the side of the pool. When the water then came out of my lungs, I said, thank you because you saved me. Now, had I stayed at the edge of the pool and had never been thrown in, I wouldn't know to thank him. But because he got in in a place where I didn't know how to get out of my own devices, and because he brought me back out, that then speaks to what is the fallacy to inclusion. I don't know that I'm saved till I've been drowning. And when I've been drowning, it's not till I've been revived that I can look for the one who brought me out. As a consequence, I can't really praise them until I have an experience. And so everything that you taught on TBN, everything that you demonstrated on Azusa was about praising God for a situation that you could have died in. Now, if you've never been in a situation where you never died, then you don't know how to thank God that you are alive. 
so it then be speech to the gaping loophole of those who really don't understand when I get to heaven and while I live on earth, I can't